Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bethlehem United Methodist Church. Uh, we especially welcome any guests that we have with us this morning. And if you're a first time visitor, we have a gift for you in our narthex. It is uh, outside these double doors here. And there will be greeters after the service to meet you and tell you about the church. And if you would like a tour, they can also do that. So welcome and please come again. If you're a regular visitor to Bethlehem, uh, we would love to have you join our church. So if you'd like to join the church, please let uh, Pastor Lord know. Also, there's uh, attendance folders in each pew. If you wouldn't mind, uh, fill those out and pass them along. And if you have any new information, please add that to the attendance folders. We also have large print bulletins that the ushers have. If anybody needs a large print bulletin, please raise your hand and the ushers will uh, get one to you. And uh, we have a reminder uh, that we have a nursery for children up to age three. So if there's any kids that want to go to the nursery up to age three. And then we also have children ages four through first grade are invited to Kids Corner which is our children's church following the children's prayer. So if you need assistance with that, uh, please raise your hand. There's a number of announcements in the bulletin, so please uh, take your bulletin and read through the announcements. And there's several that I would like to highlight for you this morning. The Council on Ministry will meet tomorrow night at 7 p.m. in room 106 at the church. Second one is the United Methodist Men will meet this Tuesday, November the 18th at 6 p.m. Special guest is a cardiologist who will speak of his experience in Afghanistan. Next announcement is the uh, United Methodist Women will meet on Thursday, November the 20th at a special time, which is 12.30 p.m. to stuff the teddy bears for the Franklin County Hospital ER. And then mark your calendars for Thursday, November the 27th, as we celebrate Thanksgiving with a lunch at Bethlehem from 12 to 3 p.m. All are invited. Volunteers to set up and food will also be needed. Um, so you can sign up today in the Narthex, which is also outside these doors. And then uh, after the service today, please plan to stay for the annual UMW Potato Bake Luncheon to benefit the Society of St. Andrew. Now, please let us stand for the choral call to worship, which is found in your bulletin. join me in the opening prayer, also in the bulletin. At various times, O Lord, a gray, unmoving fog hugs our hearts like darkness. Great God of light, we want to see clearly. We want to push back the cloud and feel the warming sun of your presence. But our impatience accomplishes nothing, and the fog hugs even tighter. Teach us the art of patience. Let us know when to sit in wonder and when to strive for justice. 
Let us trust your loving ways which unfold even in the morning mist and evening shadows of our spirits. Be as close to us, patient God, as your fog which hugs the hills. Amen. I invite you to pass the peace. Please greet your neighbors and welcome them. The peace of the Lord be with you. turn in your hymnal to page 881 for our affirmation of faith. It is the Apostles' Creed, the traditional version, number 881. Please join me in this historic affirmation of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time I'd like to invite the children to come up for our children's time.
Good morning, boys and girls. I brought with me a bowl. This bowl came from Romania, which is a country over near Hungary, where our sister church is in Seged, Hungary. Tell me what you see on the bowl. You see a sheep? What else? You think it's Jesus? And Jesus is... What is this call a person that takes care of sheep? Shepherd. Shepherd. And what is this? Shepherd's staff, right? So we know, and you're right, Jesus is sometimes called the Good Shepherd. This reminds us of one of the stories that Jesus told, and Jesus taught about God in what we call parables or stories, and we all like stories. And this is a story about a shepherd that had 100 sheep, and one of the sheep was missing, one of the little lambs. And so the shepherd leaves the 99 and he goes and looks for the lost sheep. And when he finds the lost sheep, he puts it on his shoulders and brings it home and calls his neighbors and friends and says, let's have a party, let's rejoice because my sheep was lost and now it's found. I thought it might be fun to kind of act this out. Who would like to be my lost sheep? Peyton, you want to be a lost sheep? Okay, why don't you go over behind the piano and get lost over there, okay? <laughs> well, you know what I mean. No. All right. Uh, oh, I love my sheep. I have a hundred sheep. I better count them. One, two, three, 97, 98, 99. I'm missing a sheep. Oh, I'm worried about my lost sheep. I must go find my sheep. <laughs> Sheep, where's my lamb? Where's my lamb? My little sheep. <laughs> oh, I need help. Lamb, where are you, lost? There you are, lost sheep. And I put you on my shoulder. Okay, let's go. Let's go. There we go. There we go. Okay. Bring him home. Okay, so the story, if Jesus told these stories about a shepherd and a sheep and losing one, he's telling us how much God loves us, and God is the good shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd, and we are his sheep, and God doesn't want any of us to be lost because he loves us, and when we do get lost, he comes and finds us and brings us home. Do you have a prayer with me? Thank you, Jesus, that you're the good shepherd that you love all your sheep and you don't want any of us to be lost. Thank you that you come and find us and you bring us home when we are. Bless these boys and girls, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, boys and girls. Those of you who are heading to Kids' Corner, you can go with Miss Linda. was working out, ready to get ready for that uh, <laughs> weight on my back. Well, good morning and welcome to all of you on this beautiful Sunday morning. We have uh, really some special things happening today. Some of them relate to missions, some of them relate to birthdays, some of them relate to music. And uh, I'll just say a welcome to the Hicks family and to the Woodford family as they celebrate the birthdays of Calvin Woodford back in September and now Glenn Hicks tomorrow. Uh, both of them have turned 90, or will turn, and Glenn is always quick to remind Calvin that he's older than, <laughs> than, than Glenn. So following the worship today, during the potato bake, and we're all invited back for that, there's a cake, and there's some pictures that uh, uh, Calvin was in the Navy and Glenn was in the Army, and there's a story around that that uh, they'll be glad to tell you how they, how they chose to be in the Army and the Navy, but both of them were World War II veterans, and so we honor both of these guys and say happy birthday to you, but please come back and do that officially after the service. Uh, as we mentioned today, we have some mission emphasis. Uh, one is that in the end of February and March of this coming year, in 2015, Bethlehem is sponsoring a, a mission trip to Guatemala. And um, Bill and Carolyn Kuntz will come and share about that um, experience if you'd like to be a part. So Bill, Carolyn.
Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. As, uh, as David said, we're uh, here to talk to you about a little bit about the mission trip to the Mi Refugio School in uh, Guatemala. First of all, a little bit of history about the school. Uh, the school was started 27 years ago by Kari Engen, a woman from Rockville, Maryland, that while she was working, uh, doing mission work in Mexico, um, had heard about uh, these uh, people that were living in the um, garbage dump in Guatemala City. And she received a calling from God that told her that she needed to go there and start a school for these children. Um, when the school first started 27 years ago, uh, they had 50 students. Um, since then, in that 27 years, the school has grown to, they now provide a non-denominational Christian education for 400 children in grades pre-kindergarten through ninth grade. And the school provides these children an opportunity to get an education so they can hopefully break out of the, uh, the poverty that they live in. Because like here, um, education's free in Guatemala, but you have to be able to supply your uniforms and books and supplies, and if you can't afford it, then you're not allowed to go to school. So in addition to providing the education, the uniforms, books, and supplies, the school also provides the children to um, a hot breakfast and lunch every day, which for most of them is the only food they're going to get that day. Um, you may recall that uh, last year we were planning a mission trip for earlier this year to, um, to the school, but due to the health concerns of, uh, of CARI, those uh, mission trips had to be canceled. Well, since then, um, CARI's health has not really improved, but it has stabilized somewhat, and she has also turned over a lot of the day-to-day -day operation of the school to several of her staff members. So because of all of those things, they've decided that the school is ready to start accepting mission teams again next year. So that's why we're here. As David said, the um, mission trip is scheduled for um, February 27th through March the 7th of 2015. And we're estimating that the cost per person for the, for the mission trip will be about $1,450. That would include the uh, round trip airfare, uh, room and board at the school, and all the other incidental expenses for traveling there. And we just wanted to let you know that if you feel called to join this mission trip but are concerned that the cost might be a barrier, please come and talk to us because there is money available to help out with that. Um, so while we're at the school, some of the opportunities for things to do there, um, there's always maintenance and construction work to be done on the campus. When you've got a school with 400 children, there's always work to be done. Uh, carpentry, plumbing, electrical, masonry. Um, so if that's the kind of thing you feel called to do, there's plenty of that. If not, there's also um, teaching opportunities um, to work with the children, teaching them uh, sewing. Uh, there's a computer lab that we help out with them there. Uh, we teach English classes um, when the mission teams are there. Uh, they have a bakery where the children are, are taught um, baking. Uh, there's a woodworking shop. And for the preschoolers, there's arts and crafts that uh, mission teams participate in. And also, when there are doctors, nurses, uh, dentists, and hygienists, people like that on the mission teams, um, they also do medical and dental for the children and their families. So why are mission teams important to this, this school? Well, um, like the children's message said, these, these are the lambs in Guatemala that, that we need to find. <laughs> Um, one of the things we do is transport much needed supplies to the school. Um, we go with two huge suitcases each and one little carry-on and that's our clothes. And pretty much everything else in the two, two big suitcases are supplies for the school. Things like clothing, um, school supplies, paper, pencils, notebooks, etc. Personal hygiene supplies, such as toothpaste and toothbrushes, soap, washcloths, combs, brushes, things like that, and, and vitamins for the kids. Each child gets a vitamin every day just to round out their, their nutrition. Um, we also um, 
sometimes take prenatal vitamins for um, expectant mothers in the community. Um, one of the things we do while we're there is we provide extracurricular educational or enrichment activity opportunities for the children and that's in the area like Bill said in, in sewing computers baking English um, classes woodworking and arts and crafts for the younger children and the big thing is love we're called to love and uh, we provide a lot of love for those children we provide um, just evidence that we care just as much as God cares. Well, God cares more. <laughs> but we try. <laughs> uh, how can you participate? Well, first of all, you can prayerfully consider um, joining the, the team as a, as a mission team member. Um, since it's coming quickly, we need to know this week if you're interested, um, and we'll need a deposit of $500 by the first of, uh, around the first week of December. Um, another thing you can do if you can't go is, is to provide and collect supplies for the school, and we'll have more information about that in the coming months, about what we'll be collecting when, as soon as we know what the school needs most this year. Um, also, you can provide financial support. Um, for mission team members or um, for supplies for the school or directly to the school. Um, it, it costs about $31,000 a month to operate the school. Um, each family that has children going pay what they can. That is often very little. Um, but it gives them a chance to have some ownership in the school. And as you all know, when you've got something invested in it, um, you're a little bit more committed uh, to make sure your children are there and doing their homework and things like that. <laughs> um, the, the money um, not only goes for, the, for teaching and, and supplies, but also for the food that the kids get and the, and the staff salaries and utilities and, and uh, fuel, etc. cetera. Um, and it all comes from donations from people in congregations like ours. Um, you can also pray, and, and we can never pray enough. We can pray for Kari Engen, we can pray for the school, we can pray for the children and their families, we can t pray for mission team members, and we can pray above all that God will continue to bless this wonderful mission and that it will be first in everything they do, and that God will be first in everything they do. Uh, we'll be at the Welcome Center after the service if you have any questions or would like some more information and thank you for listening. Thank you Carolyn, thank you Bill and they they will be um, available for questions or for more interest uh, after the service. As we move towards our, our prayer time I do call your attention to the blue insert that um, lists names for whom we're praying and they're number of needs there. I, I would like to give a quick update about my um, health situation. I did go to UVA on Friday and um, met with the doctor there who um, I was really, really pleased with. He scheduled a, me for an MRI in early December and uh, I'll have more information after that but so far um, no new information but uh, thank you for your, your prayers. Um, and so as we prepare for prayer, I invite you to sing uh, He is Lord, which is printed in your bulletin. So may we be called to prayer as we sing. Thank you, Jesus, that you are Lord. And thank you for the opportunity to be together with so many of us on this Sunday morning to set aside the cares and worries of the day and the world and to come into your presence with thing, singing and into your courts with praise to worship you this day, to turn our eyes upon Jesus and to say thank you, Lord. 
you are God. To have this time where we pray for the needs of our, our world, praying for peace, praying particularly for children who are struggling, those who are hungry, those who are cold, those who are without clothing and shelter, those who are refugees, victims of war. We ask God for peace in our world and that world leaders would turn to you and turn away from violence and strife. And in our own nation, Lord, we pray for help. Help in our families, help in our churches, help in our hearts, Lord. And on this day particularly, may we be reminded of who we are in you, that we are your beloved, that we are children of light and day, and that you call us to live in that way. So thank you. Thank you for our brothers and sisters who love us, who pray for us, who care for us. And we pray for those who are around us today, the person sitting beside us. We lift them up and we ask God that you meet their need, whatever it is. Fill them with your spirit. Fill them with your love. Empower us all as we seek to be the church that you call us to be, the people that we know we can be through your strength, making a difference in this world, helping others along the way. We give you this worship service. May it honor you. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yesterday afternoon, Bethlehem hosted a concert by Jennifer and Arturo Araya, and um, it was a concert to um, raise funds for uh, adoption of another child. They adopted Shanti, who is from the Ukraine, and their hope and plans are to adopt a child uh, in the coming year, uh, or maybe before the end of the year. Okay. And so uh, Jennifer will say a bit about that. They're going to play the offertory and the anthem. Uh, they are cello soloists, or cello duet. And uh, so this is uh, Be Thou My Vision. So let us worship as we present to God our tithes and offerings.
praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for all the gifts that we have in life. Bless now these gifts that we return to you, these gifts that belong to you. Multiply them and use them for the glory of your kingdom and the work of your church. We pray in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Glenn. Our scripture this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, and it is also printed on the back of the bulletin, starting in verse 1. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in the darkness for that day of surprise, will of surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep at night and those who are drunk get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live in him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning. Arturo and I would like to thank you all for having us back again, um, not only for the concert yesterday evening, but also to share with you in the service this morning. Um, many of you probably heard our adoption testimony when we were here at the beginning of August, and I shared with you the story of how we adopted our daughter, Shanti, which is indeed a wonderful story, but even as I was sharing that with you, it wasn't the full story, for we had already felt God pulling us back to Eastern Europe for another. And when that first thought first came to our minds um, early in the summer in May and June, our immediate reaction was to just toss the idea aside. Things were going so well with Shanti and we're just wonderfully happy together. She's a fabulous child and we're just so overjoyed to be her parents. Why would we want to rock the boat? Why would we want to do anything that would change that? But we prayed about it and we knew that God was calling us to go back. And on July 30th, just a few days before we were here last time, we were put in touch with two families who both met the same 10-year-old little boy who lives right now in an orphanage about five kilometers from where Shanti grew up. And we knew that God was telling us, this is the little boy that, that I have intended to be your son. So a couple weeks after we were here in August, we signed the commitment papers and decided that we were gonna go back, we're gonna adopt again. But at the time, our intention was that we would travel in May. I've started a new job, and that job was what was going to financially allow us to finance the adoption. Um, and I needed time to work at that new job. It's a school job, and needed time to work there for us to be able to pay for it. So we started our paperwork, and we told our facilitators our plan, and you know we were we were good. We're following the Lord's will. And just a couple of days later, we got an email that just shook our foundation and rocked us to the core. There's an error in the paperwork of the little boy that we hope to adopt. His official documents at the Central Adoption Agency in his country have marked him to become unavailable for adoption beginning in January 2015. If a family does not arrive in country before the end of this year, he will never be able to be adopted by anyone, not by an international family, not by a family in his country, no one. He will grow up as an orphan. And we didn't know what to do. I mean, we finished an international adoption less than a year ago, and there was just absolutely no way we could afford to do it again so quickly. 
On top of that, the paperwork for Shanti's adoption took over seven months, and that was just the paperwork, and we didn't know if it was even possible to complete the paperwork in the eight weeks that would be required to travel by the end of the year. And we prayed, and we were on our knees, and we cried, and we prayed, and we just really didn't know what to do. We felt like, God, we're following your will. You told us to go back for this child. Why would you do this? And still God said, go. And we said, no, God, we don't have the money. How are we supposed to do this? And still God said, go. And it was a Thursday night that we received the email, and I remember that night right before bed typing out a text message to our adoption facilitator telling her, We've made the decision, we've prayed about it. We're gonna try to adopt this little boy. I don't know if we'll be able to do it, and it may come down to us getting the paperwork done in time and still not having the money and getting our travel dates and not being able to go because we can't pay for it. But we're gonna do our best. And that's how we went to bed that night. And I woke up the next morning with an email in my inbox from a family that we barely know and we'd only told them a couple days before, hey, do you know we're adopting again? They were giving us $1,000 to help with our adoption costs. And then Saturday morning, I woke up to another email in my inbox. Another family that, again, we barely know, said, hey, I've got some money that I've been wanting to tithe from a, a gift from a family member, and so I'm going to tithe that to you. You've got $3,000 more for your adoption. And that afternoon, another family that we know called us and said, hey, we've been, we've been praying about this, and we've got another $3,000 for you. And oh, by the way, if you come up short at the end, we'll give you an interest-free loan. Now, I want you to fundraise for the whole amount, but if it comes up to the end, we'll, we'll make sure that, that this little boy's got a family. So in less than 48 hours from us making the decision to follow the Lord's call, he showed us in an incredible and miraculous way that he's got this. And friends, I want to share with you today that when you follow the Lord's will, when you take that leap of faith, even if you don't know how God's going to make it work, he will. He tells us to test him and see that he is good, that his blessings will fill us to overflowing. Our lives are testimony of that. Whatever the Lord is calling you to do this morning, I challenge you to step forward in faith and say yes. The song that Arturo and I are going to share is Battle Hymn of the Republic. It's not This Is My Father's World as is printed in the bulletin. My parents heard that we weren't going to do Battle Hymn and said, no, that's my favorite, you have to play it. So here's Battle Hymn of the Republic and since this past week was Veterans Day, in honor of all the veterans and especially the two birthday veterans that are here with us.
Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Arturo. That was uh, their arrangement. Uh, you probably won't hear it like that again. Um, but didn't you feel the troops marching through? I think I did. Um, great song for today because it's about the uh, coming of Christ. And um, our passage is about the second coming of Christ. It's interesting, sometimes I'll, I'll pick the Battle Hymn of the Republic to sing on the first Sunday in Advent, which Cheryl has always uh, thought that was weird to do. Um, so since you've played it, uh, we won't sing it as a congregation on the first Sunday of Advent. But, um, but our scripture is about um, the second coming. And I've shared the story before of how I came to faith as a teenager and um, came to know the Lord, accepted Christ as my Savior, uh, invited Jesus into my life, uh, different ways to, to talk about that and different ways that I do talk about that. Um, but my, my life took a new direction at, at that time and um, I began a journey that I'm still on. But it was interesting at that time, there was a lot of emphasis on the second coming of Christ. Um, this was long before the Left Behind series, and I think the, the Left Behind has been redone as a movie. I think it's in theaters now. But there, was, uh, there were other books, um, Hal Lindsey's Late Great um, Planet Earth, and other writings that had me feeling, and I remember even sharing with someone, saying to someone that, I believe that Jesus was going to return uh, within 10 years. And I, I felt that. I felt that, you know, the signs were pointing towards that, that um, Christ was going to come within the next 10 years. Well, 10 years passed, another 10 years passed, another 10 years, another 10 years. For 40 years later, um, Christ has not come. But even in Paul's day, in his writing to the church at uh, Thessalonica, and and the belief of those early believers was that he was going to come uh, soon, that his return was imminent. And so Paul writes, particularly in, in uh, chapter 4 and continuing in verse 5, and his emphasis, as you can hear, isn't so much on being prepared in a sense. Well, well it is. It's about living and being prepared because you don't know when that will be. And he says that. He, he says, you know, you, it, it may come like a thief in the night. It might come unexpectedly, or a woman going into labor. It may happen like that. But live in a way in which you are, are prepared. You know, as I get older um, and deal with health issues and or with other folks that are aging, we. We think about maybe things that are happening in our, in our bodies and in our lives where our bodies start to wear out. You know, we, we deal with aging issues and health issues and some of you are replacing parts. You know, you're getting a new knee, a new hip, a new shoulder. You heard of someone getting a new ankle, so they can do all kinds of things to, to replace parts. But the reality is that uh, one day these bodies will wear out. They are subject to disease. They are subject to, um, to just wear and tear. And one day we'll put, put off these bodies, these mortal bodies, and put on an immortal body. So my mind is thinking more that way, that, that maybe Christ will come in my lifetime, or maybe I'll meet Christ at the end of my life or days on this earth. But again, the message from Paul is be ready, be prepared, live your life in a way that if Christ were to come or if you were to die, you'd be ready to meet him. And he says in verse 4, but you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you're all children of light and children of the day. I'd like to first of all point out this word beloved. This is a word that's very important in, in scripture. And I love this word beloved because my name David means beloved. And I am beloved. I am beloved, you know? And it's wonderful. But what he's saying is that we're all loved of God. Jesus, you recall, was known as the beloved at his baptism. When he came up out of the water, the heavens opened and 
The Holy Spirit descended upon him, and the voice of God said, You are my son, my beloved. And then later, at the close of Jesus' ministry, three years later, he's on the mountain praying, the Mount of Transfiguration, and again, the voice speaks, the voice of God says, You are my son, my beloved. With you I am well pleased. We also are God's beloved. Just like the, the parable of the lost sheep, God loves every one of us and wants us to be saved. And you are children of the light, children of the day. I love this idea of being adopted. And that's straight out of Romans. Nicky Gumbel calls Romans the, the Himalayas of the New Testament. And he says if, if, if Romans is the Himalayas, then chapter 8 is Mount Everest. And verse 14, chapter 8 of Romans, all who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons and daughters. You didn't receive a, a spirit of slavery to lead you back again into fear, but you received a spirit that shows you are adopted as his children. With this spirit we cry, Abba, Father. We are adopted as sons and daughters of God. You are children of God so that we can say Abba. And it's that Aramaic word that isn't even translated because it's, it means closeness, intimacy, knowing God personally, like saying dad. We can call God dad because we are sons and daughters of our heavenly father who loves us all as his children. And we are children of the day, children of light. Now that isn't to say that we don't go through dark periods, dark times. We all experience darkness. Every Christian from the beginning of the faith, everyone I've ever read about or known about has experienced what is called the dark night of the soul. Where people will experience a sense that God is absent, that prayers are, are bouncing off the ceiling and returning, that they have maybe been abandoned. Remember Jesus' prayer? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? People go through bouts of, of depression. Our son, Mitch, when he was in high school, was experiencing some serious depression. And we would pass by this church on the way to school as I was driving him, and there was a marquee out front, and written on the marquee for a long time, and it bugged us, both of us. It said, too blessed to be depressed. And we didn't like that because it seemed to indicate that if you were depressed, then God somehow isn't blessing you, that God is out of the picture, and that's so not true. What's your favorite song? Mine's the 23rd song, the shepherd's song. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and that's a dark place, and many of you have been there, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff that comfort. So in those dark places, from a loss, from an illness, from a death, God is with us in those dark times. But this is about identity. We're not defined by those times. We're defined by God's word that says you are the beloved, that you are children, sons and daughters of God, of the light, children of the day. And so he says... So then, let's not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, but those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Now, I don't think he's talking just about drinking too much wine. And definitely, drinking too much wine can get you impaired. And that's kind of the word I want to think about, is impaired. And unfortunately, in the month ahead, there are a lot of people that get impaired from drinking too much, and they get behind the wheel of a car, and they cause a lot of destruction. But I think the word sober here can recall, be about any kind of impairment. So think about it. What is it that's impairing you from living the kind of life that God wants you to live? I'm thinking about 
worry for me. I think worry is an impairment for me that keeps me from living this life of day and and light and as a child of God. It it impairs me. It impedes that. And I worry. I worry about health. I worry about family. I worry about you. I worry about the future. And Jesus is clear on that. You know, don't worry, he says. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has its own problems. Live day to day. And it's really a matter of trust, a matter of faith. Trusting God for each day. Well, that's what I'm working on. What is it that impairs you? So he says, be sober. Put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Does that sound familiar? Faith, hope, love. Remember last Sunday when we read the first Corinthians 13, Paul talks about love, and at the close of that he said three things remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. As Carolyn said, love is powerful. Love can overcome all evil. Love and faith going together, that breastplate. Here's an image of a soldier putting on his armor. Faith and love as a breastplate. A hope of salvation as a helmet. Paul, in other places, reminds us that we are in a spiritual battle. That there are forces of darkness that want to take us out of the light and back into the darkness, back into slavery. And he says, put on the whole armor of God so that you're able to fight the devil, who is darkness. So put on the breastplate of love and faith and the helmet of the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. Unfortunately, a lot of people feel that God is a God of wrath. I think God is just a spoil sport, waiting for us to mess up so he can punish us. And I'm, I'm sorry to say a lot of that came from preachers that never made it out of the Old Testament. And even in the Old Testament, God's wrath was about saving people. Here was this small tribe of Israelites always on the very edge of being assimilated into the culture that was not of God. And even in Israel's history, There were times when there were idols, idols to Baal in the temple. Fertility cult going on. And God warned them that they headed down that path and he would send a a prophet and the prophet would say, you need to change your ways, you need to turn, turn back to God or there will be destruction. And they would ignore the prophet and destruction would come. And they would repent and then turn back for time. So God has always wanted to save us. But God is a God of love, not a God of wrath. He wants us to be saved, to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus who died for us. And he died for us because he loves us. And so he says, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him, living in the way that God intends. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are in doing Six weeks ago this weekend, I was in the hospital. I would have rather been here, but I was there. Since then, so many of you have offered me words of encouragement. You know, how's it going? How are you feeling? I'll text you, you know, having a good day today? When's your next appointment? An email that says, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. A card, a note. You're in our prayers. And that is powerful stuff. To be encouraged. And that's what it means to be a part of this family, of being brothers and sisters, of being children of our Father, being connected in that way so that we can encourage one another. And it doesn't take much. So much of our culture tears down, discourages. Paul is saying, encourage, build up. You want to go to lunch? I'm going to call you on the phone. You want to get together and talk? I'm there for you. I'm praying for you. 
I'm with you on this. How can I help you? Do you need a ride? I love you. These are words of encouragement, of building up. And Paul is saying, keep doing that. Keep doing that. Build each other up as indeed you are doing. When I was in college, uh, my grandmother was 93 and she died, I think, my junior year in college. And while I was a teenager and in those years of college, she would write to me and offer words of encouragement. And at the end of that, she would always sign it with this phrase of hers. She would say, keep on keeping on. That was her word to me. Keep on keeping on. So that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, be ready. Christ can come anytime. You can meet Christ in death any day. So be faithful. Keep on keeping on. You're children of the light. You're beloved. Live soberly. Live in a way that is good. That God is calling you to live. Because He's a God who loves you, who wants you to be saved. Encourage one another. Build each other up. Keep on keeping on. Let us pray. Thank you that we are children of the light, children of the day. We are your beloved. We are yours. So help us, we pray, to encourage each other, to build each other up, and to make a difference in the world in which we live. We pray in your name. Amen. I'd like for us to sing the song that we skipped uh, as our closing hymn. It's number 206. It's entitled, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. And really, that's our prayer, isn't it? To walk as a child of the light. Let's stand as we sing it. 206.
we're so glad that you are worshiping with us today. I do plan to stay for our potato lunch. This is a fundraiser for the Society of St. Andrew, which is right here in our own county that began in the 80s by uh, two United Methodist pastors and now is an international project to um, uh, fight hunger. And it's a great way to do that. So come back and have a potato. There's all the fixings that are there. Um, Glenn Hicks will be there. Calvin Woodford will be there and their families. Take a look at the pictures. And uh, there's birthday cake. So we're going to celebrate their birthdays. And there's other things that are happening also. Um, Arturo and Jennifer have tables that have silent auction items that you can bid on that are there. And also glorious gifts too. If you'd like to do your Christmas shopping by giving to things like uh, Henry Fork Service Center and Good Samaritans Body Camp Backpack. And their cards will be made uh, that you can give to people that say you gave so much or gave um, different things uh, in honor of someone. It's a great way to, to give Christmas presents. So please stay, okay? <laughs> All right. Let's uh, have our benediction, and I'll include a blessing so that as you go in, you can just uh, go through the line and uh, begin to, to eat lunch. Thank you, God, for this time of worship, and thank you for food that we have to eat and fellowship around the table and for the love that we share in Christ. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.